everybody here uh, in person and happy that uh, many of you are able to join with us on the internet but uh, it's just great to have everybody here today I think God's got good stuff for us today uh, I just want to say welcome to Marmaduke First Baptist Church Sunday School class uh, let's begin as we always should in prayer Heavenly Father we come to you this morning Lord and we just uh, we just ask that you be with us today Lord that your presence be here Lord that it that your words be spoken that we we learn the things that you want us to understand God that you just be with us if you're with us God then we know everything will be good and and uh, uh, we're gonna you're gonna help us as Christians God to grow in you and we just thank you that you've blessed us and allowed us to come here today Lord we know that there are folks that just need a touch from you today and we just ask that you be with them that your presence be with them but again lord be with us in our class in christ's name we pray amen all right so now we're in the book of joshua <clears throat> and uh i guess I, I, i'm gonna back up a little bit uh today and kind of make sure we understand kind of what we're looking at here in joshua because the old testament i love the old testament the old testament provides us with beautiful pictures you know as, as Christians too often uh, we get this idea well the Old Testament you know it's stories from back then and doesn't really apply to us they oh absolutely not the Old Testament uh, can teach us so much I mean yeah should we uh, study in the New Testament absolutely but I'm telling you we should be spending some time in this Old Testament because it, it paints for us pictures that as Christians we need to understand that it's just full of them and the one that we're, we're seeing here uh, let's back up to when uh, when uh, the children of Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt they were in bondage in Egypt which for us that's a picture of when we were in bondage to sin before we became believers we were in bondage to sin we were we were trapped in Egypt we were slaves to sin stuck in Egypt uh, but God sent to us a, a redeemer uh, he sent for them Moses to lead them out he sent for us Jesus Christ to lead us out of that bondage uh, and when they when they marched out of Egypt what was the first thing they came to the Red Sea uh, and the Red Sea, uh, God parted that Red Sea and they marched across that Red Sea. The Red Sea is a picture for us today of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a picture uh, for us today of baptism. Uh, because that's what when we when we're baptized it, it is a, we're showing the world that we're experiencing the, the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that's what they experienced there at the Red Sea they were going through that death burial and resurrection of Jesus they went into the sea uh, and they came out the other side and when it was done the sea closed back over and everything that they were their sins and everything they were in Egypt uh, was gone it was buried in the Red Sea and they came out the other side when they came out the other side they were no longer slaves to sin they were now children of God they became the children of Israel at that when they crossed over that Red Sea and if you think about it once they crossed over that Red Sea at any point in the future from that point on did Pharaoh was he able to come and get them and take did he come and get them and try to take them back no God God did away with him he buried him in that Red Sea. Pharaoh was gone. You never, you never hear of Pharaoh again. Pharaoh is a symbol of, of Satan. And when, once we cross that Red Sea as New Testament Christians uh, uh, through accepting Jesus Christ and through, through baptism, Satan's gone. I mean, he's not coming after us, folks. We're believers. We are, we are confident. We, are, we, we can know that we know that we know that we're on our way to heaven. Uh, and that's the situation they were in. They were, believe, they were now the children of God. That wasn't going to change. Now, here, but here's what happened. Uh, that when they crossed that Red Sea, the promised land was right there, as Kim's been preaching about the rest, the rest of Canaan. It was right there. It, it was right there in front of them. But they, it, what did they do? They didn't, take, they didn't march into the rest of Canaan. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. It was there for them, but they didn't do it. Why didn't they do it? Well, because, of, uh, uh, because they, they wanted to be in charge, and we're going to take a look at that some, but, but they wandered. And, and that's, a, that's a picture too often of us as New Testament believers. We're wandering in that desert when we don't have to be. But we wander, we choose to. We want to be in charge, and we wander in that desert. Well, the time came when, when Moses had died, that generation had died, and Joshua came along. Joshua, the captain of their salvation. And now they're standing at the River Jordan, and that's where we are now as, we, as we're reading through Joshua. We're, we're at the River Jordan, and they cross the River Jordan. Now, it's interesting. The, uh, the crossing of the River Jordan is very similar uh, to the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, God backs up the water 
and they, they march across on dry land. And so last week when we read cha uh, chapter 4 of Joshua, what was going on? They, they marched across the, the, the River Jordan, uh, and when they got to the other side, they did two things. Uh, God told him, he said, well, first of all, I want, you to go, I want you to take 12 stones out of the river Jordan, and you're going to stack them up, and you're going to make a monument over on, on the promised land side. Uh, and they did that and, and told Joshua, you go in there, and you, you take 12 stones, and you stack them up in the middle of the river Jordan so that when the water receded, when the water came back, what happened? Those 12 stones were covered up, and, the 12, and then there were the 12 stones that were on the, on the uh, promised land side. And so we're going we're gonna to be taking a look at that. We're going to talk about those 12 stones today and the significance and what they mean, what those 12 stones mean, because that's, that's where we're all in the story. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this, this story, the, 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 the exodus out of Egypt it's a, and, and into the promised land, it's a beautiful picture for us today as, as New Testament Christians, but too often... We have a bad habit of, we study a lot about Exodus. We study a lot about those 40 years wandering and the struggle. But we don't, we don't get into Joshua, the victory. And that's where we're at today. We're, we're, we're going to look at the victory that's, that's for us as New Testament Christians in this, in this promised land. Now, last week I ended with this because uh, in his book, in, uh, Joshua by Philip Keller, uh, and I read this, last, but it's so good, bear with me. I'm going to read it again because he, he just... He does a much better job than I can do. Here's what he says. <clears throat> he says, Israel days of sullenly refusing to respond to the guidance of God under Moses were gone. Their wretched complaining at the commands of the Almighty was ended. The desperate, hopeless wanderings in the wilderness of their own divided minds and emotions were now behind them. Their self-pity, self-gratification were past. They were a people with a powerful purpose determined now to take uh, territory with God. So think about it. I mean, what's going on here? This, this is a different group of people. <clears throat> this is not the group of people who were wandering in the desert for 40 years struggling and, and trying to do things their own way. That we don't want to be those people. That's a picture that we do not want to be. All right, We want to be more like this group. This group, this, this new generation, uh, they were following God. They were, they were under the command of God. They were doing what God told them to, to do. They were following him. And because of that, they were able to do what that other generation of the, the, the wandering in the desert were not able to do. All right? He goes on, he says, Likewise, for the Christians, there are those monumental occasions which stand out with startling clarity in his or her walk with God. There is the initial hour of deliverance from our slavery to sin and Satan, the enemy of our souls. That point of passing from death to life, from darkness to light, just as surely as Israel on the night of its first Passover feast escaped from servitude and slavery in Egypt to freedom under God across the Red Sea. What a great moment that is in the life of a Christian, being able to look back. I, you know, I can look back and I can, I, it was right, it was downstairs, it was at teen college. I can take you to the place downstairs in this church where I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and I was baptized. You know, I can, I can go, and what a wonderful uh, experience that was and, and in my mind I can go back to that uh, and, and it goes on it says unfortunately and unhappily for most of us as with Israel there then follows forlorn years of wandering in the wilderness of divided minds divided affections divided loyalties on on the one hand we do desire to follow Christ to comply with his commands yet sad to say on the other hand we still hanker for the former low life style of Egypt the world is very much with us. We are tantalized by its attractions, titillated by its tempting desires. Our wills are not yet made totally available to the powerful purpose of God Almighty. So in despair and despondency, we stumble around in circles, going nowhere, achieving little people of split personalities. Too often, we want to go back to Egypt. And if you look, you know, what when... Uh, 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 the, when they sent the 12 spies into the promised land uh, to go decide, you know, can we, can we take it? Uh, and Caleb and Joshua come back and said, absolutely we can take it. But the, the 10 said, oh, no, they're like giants over there. We're like grasshoppers. We can't do it. And not only that, but the children of Israel then instead of saying, oh, no, we're with Joshua and Caleb. If they say we can do it, we're going to go with it. No, the, the children of Israel said, they're right. We can't take the promised land. Not only that, they rebelled against Moses. They said, we want a new leader. 
Moses, you brought us out here in the desert to die. What did they say? They said, we want to go back to Egypt. We liked it better in Egypt. And too often as New Testament believers, <laughs> I hate to say it, but we say the same thing. God, I, I, you know, I, I want to go back to my old ways of doing things. I was comfortable with my old ways of doing things. I, I want to go back to we're no better than they were. All right? We do the same thing as they did. We claim to be Christians. We call ourselves the children of God. We insist we are following Christ. In reality, we are all the time serving ourselves and living in defeat and despair as carnal, worldly-minded individuals. Here's the thing. We like to think we're serving Satan when we're serving ourselves. You know, the, 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 the children of Israel, when they were wandering in the desert, they weren't, they weren't serving Pharaoh anymore. Pharaoh was gone. They were serving themselves. You know, the, our big, we, we like to say, well, the devil made me do it. No, you, the, you need to blame yourself. Too often we do it to ourselves. Uh, we're carnal-minded. We're self-serving, and that's what they were doing. Uh, ultimately, as with Israel, the day dawns when there comes an end to the dismal old self-life of despair and discouragement. In an act of bold faith in God, we desire to abandon ourselves and capitulate completely to Christ. We give over the government of our lives to God himself. We submit our wills de uh, deliberately to the sovereignty of his spirit. Then in implicit, unquestioning obedience, we step out to comply with his wishes. This is a titanic pivot point in any person's walk with God. This is the crossing of the Jordan. This is, if you will, the crossing of the Rubicon for the Christian. From then on, there is no looking back. There is no returning to the weary old wilderness days of the wretched desert years. We are moving into new ground with God. This deserves and demands a bold memorial. That should be the picture of us today. Too often we, we see us, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm wandering in the desert. No, no, no. That's not what God intends for us. He intends for our, the picture of ourselves to be more like these people. That when they're crossing the River Jordan, they're following God. They've decided, you know what? Following myself and, and trying to take care of myself and being self-centered has not worked. I think, I think these new, this new generation looked at that past generation and said, well, if they tried, it didn't work. We need something new. We need to do something. Let's, let's follow God. Let's follow him and let's do the things he wants uh, us to do. And when they did that, they were able to cross that river Jordan. They were able to cross into the promised land. They were able to be victorious, not through themselves, but through God. A few pages over, Philip Keller, he says this. They had passed from defeat to domination, from tragedy to triumph, from despair to delight, not because they were a great people, but because they had obeyed a great God. And you know, that's for us today, folks. I'm, I'm not, Kim was talking about today. He said, man, I'm a weak, I'm weak human. Uh, we are weak people. We are not great people, but we serve a great God. And if we will follow God and follow his commands as these people are doing, then he will lead us across that river Jordan and we will, we will enter the rest of Canaan, as Brother Kim has been talking about. But we, to, in order to do that, we have to stop following ourselves. We have to stop being self-centered and we have to buy in and we have to start finding out what it is that God wants us to do. All right, so that, that was a, 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 a Philip Keller from his book. But now I want to mention, uh, uh, looking at a commentary from J. Vernon McGee. I love J. Vernon McGee. Uh, I grew up with J. Vernon McGee. I've told you this before. I grew up listening to J. Vernon McGee, not because I wanted to, but because my grandmother, I'm, I don't know, she found, there, was, there must have been a J. Vernon McGee radio station. I don't know, because all I know is every time I would go to my grandmother's house, she was listening to J. Vernon McGee. Uh, and I mentioned it to, to Brother Kim uh, uh, a year or so ago. Uh, and uh, he bought me a set of, of J. Vernon McGee commentaries, and I love those, those J. Vernon McGee commentaries. Uh, and in looking at what J. Vernon McGee has to say about it, he talks about these 12 stones and the significance of these 12 stones. Now, there were 12 stones that, were, that Joshua put in the riverbed, all right? And there were 12 stones that were, that were stacked up as a monument over on the, in the Promised Land. Uh, J. Vernon McGee speaks about these, and he says that's a picture, uh, those 12 stones that are put in the riverbed. Now, understand, uh, and, and when they, there, were, there were 12 tribes, all right? There were 12 tribes of Israel. Those 12 tribes of Israel, the children of God, when you read about them, 
that, that's a picture that represents us. All right? We are now the children of God. We are now the 12 tribes. All right? So when he put those 12 stones and he stacked them up in that riverbed, they were representing those people, and they're representing us today. What happened when the river uh, came back and flowed back in? It covered them up. They were buried. The river buried those 12 stones. It is a picture for us today as Christians, not going back to our our salvation uh, 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 in the beginning, but this sanctification. It's a picture, you know, I've spoke of it before, of that, that we are saved. That, you know, when, when I was 17 years old downstairs, I, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was saved. I've never been any more saved or less saved than I was from that day. I'm telling you, I, I am securely saved. From that point, when they crossed the Red Sea, they were saved. They became the children of God, and that was not going to change, all right? Uh, Pharaoh was not going to come looking for them anymore, all right? Now, but they wandered, they struggled, and we sometimes struggle, and we need a new experience. We need, uh, and Jay, what J. Vernon McGee is talking about here, is we need that daily death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what the, this is a picture of here, that, that every day, that as, as we're traveling through this, this process of being children of God, that we need to, to, to uh, the, just as these 12 stones were buried in, in the River Jordan, and then they put 12 stones on the, on the uh, Promised Land side, and those 12 stones are a picture of our daily resurrection, this walk that we're going through, that we die daily, that every day, uh, we should get up and we should pray, God, I pray today that, that, that Keith Ritchie will die out, that I will die today, but that I will be resurrected to walk in newness of life through you, that, that, that it's not just a, 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 a something that happened when we accepted Jesus Christ, but we're being saved. We're going through this process. Every day we should expe uh, uh, experience the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. J. Vernon McGee points out, go to, if you have your Bibles, Romans 6, 1 through 14. Romans 6, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 14. Now here, Paul is talking to the believers in Romans. Now it's important that we understand uh, he's not talking to non-believers. Right? He's talking to believers, and that's what we are here today. And he's talking here about this, uh, this dying out to the old man and walking in newness of life. All right, so let's, let's take a listen to what he has to say. Uh, verse, or chapter 6, verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He, he, you know, uh, th this idea, and, and I've heard this before, well, you know, you Southern Baptists and, and your security, the believer, you think, well, then you can just go out and sin all you want because, you know, you're saved. You don't have to worry about it. Oh, no, no. Here, that's what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, you're saved, you, you, you have accepted Jesus Christ, you are a believer, you are a son, you're a child of God. But he's saying, so does that mean we can just go out and sin all we want? Absolutely not. Why would you want to do that? Why do you want to wander in the desert for 40? Why do you want to do that? When the River Jordan is right there, you can cross the River Jordan and, and cross into the rest of Canaan, the Promised Land, verse 3. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also would walk in newness of life. He's saying we should be walking in newness of life, not wandering around in the desert. We should be able to take the rest of Canaan. We should be able to get into that promised land. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in, in, in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also 
yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Our Lord, he's talking about us now. He's not, he's not talking about the experience of, of salvation, all right, that, that initial salvation when we accepted Jesus Christ. He's talking about now as we walk day to day. He's saying you shouldn't be living in sin. Uh, we, we should be experiencing this newness of life. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall, have, shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. Now, what we tend to concentrate on when we read that, I think, or I, I have a bad habit of it, it says that I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. I start thinking, well, I'm not under the law, I, and I worry about the law. I, am, I, am I sinning? You know, if I'm sinning, what's that doing to my relationship with God? And, and, and we're worried about that, all right? Basically, we're worried about wandering in the desert, all right? Uh, but we, we don't think about it, but it goes on and says, but we're under grace. I mean, there's power in that grace, folks. I don't have to worry about the law anymore. Now, that's not to say I don't have to sin anymore. I don't have to worry about that stuff because, because guess what? Satan's not coming looking for me. I, I'm covered in the blood. When God looks down on old Keith Ritchie, he doesn't see me. He doesn't see my sins. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry about that anymore. I live under grace. I'm in a, I'm in a new position. I'm in a position just like these children uh, were crossing the River Jordan where now I can do that. I have the ability. Before that, before we couldn't do that. We didn't have that ability. We were under the law, and the law said you're, you're guilty. All right? you, you can't live up to the law. You're guilty. You can't go into the promised land. Who are you? Who do you think you are to think that you're going to live, that you're going to move into this promised land? You can't do it. But grace tells me, oh, yes, you can. God says, by my grace, you can have it. You can have the promised land. You can move into that, into that promised land. So, so J. Vernon McGee, I love what he has to say here, and we need to understand that. You know, we get caught up. We spend too much time thinking about as Christians wandering in the, in the desert for 40 years, folks. We need to start looking over that River Jordan. We need to start concentrating on the promised land and figure out how do we get to the promised land. And Joshua paints a picture for us uh, here uh, of, of, of how we do that. All right, so let's, let's get chapter 5, Joshua chapter 5. Let's read part of chapter 5 because this is, chapter 5 is kind of a continuation of what's going on. And we see here in chapter 5, uh, some more of the things that the, the children of God here are doing uh, to, to put themselves in a position to take the promised land. So uh, Joshua chapter 5 says this, And it came to pass when all the kings of, of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. They just realized they're on our side of the river. You know, they thought, well, hey, we're all, we got some time because this was in the spring. The, the river's flooded. They can't cross the river right now. So we at least have some time. And now they're finding out, nope, that God's got them over on our side of the river, and they're scared. They should be. All right? Verse, verse 2 says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the uh, cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were male, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, they had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. 
and their children whom he raised up in their stead, then uh, them Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. All this time, you know, that was a very important uh, aspect of being a child of God. That was part of the covenant was that they would, would be circumcised. But I, I, don't, I don't think we realize this bunch that wandered in the desert for 40 years, they were self-centered, they whined, they complained. The things that God told them to do, they didn't do. I mean, they knew. They knew they were supposed to be circumcised, but they had children. Did they circumcise, circumcise their children? No, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't follow the commandments of God. They did their own thing. And so here, the first thing, they're, they're over into the promised land. And now think about this. There's Jericho. I mean, it's, it's one of the strongest outposts in, in, the, in, the, in the promised land. There are enemies there. What's the, the, what, what should they do? What do they need to do? They need to come and get rid of you, all right? Uh, you better be ready. But what does God tell them to do? You stop right here, and you do what you were supposed to do over, in, in, over there, and you circumcise all of the males. Now, that puts them in a very vulnerable situation. Uh, however, they're following the commands of God. Very important. Verse 8, And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their place in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Where, uh, wherefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. So they crossed over the river Jordan. They're at this new place. And they set up camp here, and it's called Gilgal. Gilgal, Gilgal means a rolling away. Because God said at this point, your, the, the, your reproach of Egypt is rolled away. It's no more. You are new. You are ready. You are ready to take ground into the promised land. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. So now once again, they're being circumcised and they're, they're taking Passover because that was one of the feasts. They were, it's the time for them to do that. And so they're following the commands of God. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on one morrow after, after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. All right, so right here in chapter 5, uh, uh, what we've read here, uh, two things uh, uh, have happened here. Uh, one, they, they have been circumcised and they have, they have taken Passover. Right? So now, instead of going their own way and doing their own thing, they're finding out what is it that God wants us to do and that's what we're going to do. Now, if I'd crossed over the River Jordan and, and Jericho was across the plain, I might be thinking, hey, everybody get your swords out. We got to get ready. We're about to go to war. We got to get we got to get ready for war. Is that what they were doing? No. God said no. Instead of doing what made sense to them, which is what they did for 40 years, they were doing what made sense to what God had told them to do. Uh, and so they were they were circumcised uh, and they were uh, uh, and, and they they took uh, uh, the the Passover, which for us is communion. Communion is that picture for us of Passover. But very quickly, I just want to finish with this. Let's compare these two groups of people. If you go back to the, the group that wandered in the desert for 40 years, here are some of the things that they did. When Moses went up on the mountain, they told Aaron, we want you to build us a golden calf. We need something to worship. Why did they need something to worship? They had God. The reason they needed something to worship is because they weren't worshiping God. When you don't worship God, a vacuum will be created and something will fill. You're going to worship something. As human beings, we are meant to and built to worship something. And you're going to worship something, and they refused to worship God, so they decided they needed this golden calf. All right? And if you'll remember, after that, God, God wanted to do away with them, and Moses talked him out of it. All right? Then, when the 12 spies went over, and they came back, and only Joshua and Caleb said, hey, we can take it, not only did the people believe the ten who said we couldn't, but they said we want a new leader. We want to go back to Egypt. We don't want to, we don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. All right? So again, instead of following the commands of God, they're, they're, they're figuring out on their own. What do I think we need? I think we need to go back to Egypt. All right? uh, but what else did they do? 
they complained remember uh, the whole time they're complaining against the, they, and they don't trust the providence of god the reason god had to give them manna was because they didn't trust that he was going to take care of them out there and even when he gave them the manna they grabbed and complained about it uh, they rebelled against uh, god's leaders they rebelled against Aaron. Remember, they wanted their own. They, you know, the the uh, they brought Aaron's staff. God said, "Bring his staff." And Aaron's staff budded and bloomed and, and put on almonds. And he showed them, "No, he is my leader." But they didn't like that. They wanted to, they wanted to be the leaders themselves. They couldn't and wouldn't meet his standard. He gave them the Ten Commandments. They they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Basically, what it all comes down to, they wanted to be in charge of this thing. All right, and because they wanted to be in charge, God said, "Okay, fine, you be in charge, and you can just wander yourselves around that desert for forty years if that's what you, you that's what you want." Now let's compare that to this new group. What do they do? They followed the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the throne of God. They followed it. You know, remember God said, "You follow it to, into the River Jordan," and they did that. They follow, and what's in that 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 Ark of the Covenant? It represents God's providence, His authority, His standard. They followed those things. Uh, they sanctified themselves. God said, sanctify yourselves. They did that. They cleaned themselves up. They set themselves apart for the work of God. He told them to circumcise themselves, and they did that. Now, think about it. Now, I don't want to get too into this, but these are not children, all right? These are grown men who he says, you circumcise yourself. This, this, uh, this activity, this circumcision was a painful cutting away of the old it represents circumcision for us as new testament christians is not a simple wonderful nice little thing it's a it's a painful cutting away that we need to we need to be aware hey i'm willing to do that um, if sometimes it's going to be painful, but if, I, if that's what I have to go through, I'm willing to go through this painful cutting away of the old self so that I can be new, so that I can do what God wants me to do. Uh, and and they, they took Passover. Uh, Passover represents, uh, for us today, it's communion. When we take communion, it's, it's very similar to that, that Passover meal. And what is it all about? It's about taking the bread. It's about accepting not my life, but the life of Christ. And it's, it's about taking his blood, that his blood is what covers my sins. And that, so that who do we want, who do we, who are we more similar to here? Are we more similar to the, the people who wandered in the desert for 40 years? Do we want things our way and we're bound and determined to get it our way and we do all this silly stuff and we, ne we never get where we need to be? Or are we going to be more like this new generation that when God says, here's what I want you to do, if you want to cross into the rest of Canaan, if you want to cross into the, the promised land, here's what you need to do. Folks, I'm telling you, as New Testament Christians, we need to get in this word and we need to pray, and we need to find out, God, what is it you want me to do? Uh, what do you want me to do? Not what I want to do, but what is it you want me to do so that I can, walk, that I can cross into the rest of Canaan, so that I can cross into that promise? And that's what we should be concentrating ourselves on. Too often, uh, you know, we want, it, we, we want to serve our own purposes, uh, and, and, and we, all we do is wander in the desert. So, so I encourage you, let's start concentrating not on what we want, but what, on he, what, what he wants, because he's painted a picture for us, folks. He has said, if you do this, here's what's going to happen. If you do what I tell you to do, you're going to cross into the promised land. And this is, not, this, is, this is for us as Christians. This is for us. This is what we need to do, all right? So, so uh, I encourage you, let's, let's start thinking about that and concentrating. Let's become uh, the children of God who crossed the River Jordan and not the children of God who wandered in the desert for 40 years, all right? All right, thank you so much. Uh, uh, next week, we'll move on from there. And, hey, we're about, we're about to head toward Jericho. Big things are going to happen in Jericho, exciting things. So, so it's going to be good stuff. So I uh, thank you again for, for being here with us uh, in person or being here on the Internet. Thank you so much. I uh, hope God has shown you his word today. Uh, let's have prayer, and we'll be dismissed. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we just thank you, God. You have blessed us. You have opened your word to us, God, uh, and shown us your way. Not our way, God. You've shown us your way. And we just ask that now that as, as New Testament Christians, God, that we will follow you, that we will do what not what we want, but we will, we will do what you want, God. And we just thank you for showing that to us. God, again, I know there are folks out there, there are families that have lost loved ones and they're, they're struggling, God. I just ask that you wrap your arms around them uh, and that your peace, that peace that passes all understanding, God, that your peace will be upon them today and they will know that it is you who is providing that for them. Lord, I just pray that you will keep everyone safe and that you'll bring us back next week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everybody out there.